Good evening. Thank you for joining us at our Education in the City online series on strategies to reading and learning in current times. This evening, we are happy to have with us two speakers, Dr. Lo Chun Yi and Sarah Monzi. They will be introduced by our moderator, Joy Tully. Joy is a children's book author and co-founder of Pepperdoc Press. I shall now pass on the session to Joy. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me as your moderator for this session. As mentioned by our MC, today's topic is strategies for reading and learning in current times. And I can think of no one better position to share about it than our two speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Lo Chin Yi. She is an associate professor with the National Institute of Education and, National, uh, and Nanyang Technological University. Ching Yi's research focuses on literature and literacy education, particularly on reading and school libraries. She is the creator of the How We Read podcast series, which focuses on reading proficiencies required for future readiness. For today's webinar, uh, she will be sharing some interesting findings about the reading habits of our teenagers and strategies for engaging them in more independent reading. Over to you, Chin Yi. Thank you so much, Joy, uh, for that introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for taking your evening to be here with us. Okay, so I hope you can see the PowerPoint slides. Uh, okay, so the title of my talk today is Independent Reading as Strategy for Teen Reading. So I'm gonna focus on teen reading because that's where most of my work is. And I'm gonna talk about independent reading. Okay, and uh, what is independent reading? It's basically the idea that it's self-directed reading that teens or even children choose to do for themselves or even in school as well. So why is independent reading important? Uh, if you look at the PISA 2018 results, there are some things inside that should make us sit up in our chairs. I think what we find is that compared to the earlier findings, uh, students now read less for leisure Okay, and most of them, they reported reading to fulfill practical needs. You need to remember these are 15 year olds who are doing the survey. Uh, students also reported reading more in online formats, typically short forms such as in chats, online news or practical websites. They read less for enjoyment and they consider reading a waste of time. I think for myself as a reading researcher, what is of most concern is that there's a widening gap between high and low proficiency students. Okay, and what this means is that actually our high proficiency students are getting better year on year. Our low proficiency students, they are doing very well internationally, but in terms of improvement, they are not improving. They're kind of, you know, staying where they are, which is why there is a gap um, between high and low proficiency students. So what is independent reading? So this is a picture. You can see the child here is reading. It is reading that the child chooses to do by himself or herself, typically at home, but it can also be done in school as well. Why is independent reading important? Okay, uh, I think for a lot of us, we would think, well, it's important because, you know, there is a correlation to traditional reading proficiency. So if you read more, you get better at reading. Uh, it is related to academic achievement, but I think more importantly uh, are the next few points that if you read independently, uh, then you are able to direct your learning. You're able to acquire what Susan Newman calls information capital. You're in a position to read more in order to learn about the world and to learn about things. Um, reading is connected to student well-being as well, because you know when they read, they feel better and it's connected to deep reading. Deep reading is the idea, Marianne Wolf has talked about it, but the idea that you will go deeper into a text to explore, to reflect, to be critical. Okay, it is also interestingly connected to digital reading proficiencies. So skills like searching on the internet, knowing how to um, make the distinction between, you know, what's real, what's to be believed in the news. These are digital reading proficiencies and studies have found that if you read independently, if you read in your leisure time, if you do more of that, there is an association with your digital reading proficiencies. And I think in this day and age, you know, we want our students to be flexible readers who are able to move in and out of different kinds of readings as well. Okay, so 
Now, I want to explain the connection between reading, uh, learning to read and reading to learn and to kind of give the big picture about why it's important. Okay, learning to read is associated with things like phonics, you know, putting words together, starting to make sense of, you know, that if you put one word next to another word, there is a meaning to it. But reading to learn usually assumes that the student has a certain capacity and that they're reading to find out more about the world. And if you think about the reading process, okay, how it works is this. This is the uh, simplistic equation that I have given. But, you know, between the ages of early childhood to around early primary school, children are developing their initial reading proficiency. They're learning to put words together. They're getting to understand how things work. And as they practice more, they become competent in their reading. Now, as they become more competent, they start to enjoy the reading. Uh, when they enjoy the reading, um, they actually get more practice, okay? And as they get more practice, they become more competent. And this practice is really what we want with independent reading. And I put the quote there, a child who reads independently, extensively, so reads a lot of different kinds of texts and for leisure, gets more practice without you having to tell them to practice. Okay, the other thing I also want to point out in this day and age is that learning to read isn't something that happens only in early childhood and primary school. Even as adults, we are learning to read. You know, for my master's student, when they sign up for a course, they have to learn how to read uh, research articles. When you sign on to a new job, you know, you've got to learn to read about the job. So we're learning to read different kinds of documents, even as adults. So what are some challenges for our educators? And I think for our parents and for librarians and for all the different people who work with children. Okay, so challenge one, I'm going to talk about three different challenges, okay? Our students come from different home backgrounds and have different proficiencies and interests in reading. Um, that may seem really obvious, but perhaps let's go into the details of it. Uh, if you think about the details, um, this comes from a study during uh, Circuit Breaker last year. We interviewed 12 families, the parents as well as the children, about their reading and learning during HBL for play uh, as well as for learning. Uh, and if you look at it, I've given three kind of, you can say there are three examples, okay? So Stefan, right, he comes from a relatively well-to-do home. He's been surrounded with books and reading role models. His parents like to read. He has technologies for reading. He's got a Kindle and a tablet. And you know, his favorite author at 13 is Ken Liu. And he uses the NLB okay, app occasionally to read. And now that he's in secondary school, he doesn't read so much anymore. And then there's Barak, okay? And he's on financial assistance, but he's in a situation where he has nonprofit tuition classes since he was young. And actually his favorite author is Rick Rodian. However, the thing is when he hangs around with his friends, most of them don't read very much. He has a smartphone, but unlike the other children in our sample, he mostly uses freeware. And of course, we know it's changing. All the secondary school kids will have their personal learning device now. But at the point when we were doing our study, although he had a refurbished MacBook, it had stopped working. And then there's Tracy, right? Her mother is into reading and she's watched To All the Boys I've Loved Before on Netflix and started reading the book during her school sustained silent reading period in the morning. However, since HBL, she stopped reading because there were other things to do. So you can see for Tracy, the school reading is really important. And I want to highlight the difference here because I think what's important is to understand that when we are thinking about reading, uh, creating reading curriculum, getting our students interested in reading, we're really talking about very different reading profiles. And that's very much what our teachers have to deal with on the ground. Um, one of the clear signs, and in our 2017 research, we also saw this. If you compare the, the books at home between students who are on financial assistance, uh, students on financial assistance basically have a household income of 2,750 or less, and students who are not on financial assistance. So if you look at the item in blue, those are students who are not on financial assistance, and the ones in red, they are on financial assistance. I think very clearly you'll see that students on financial assistance tend to have 20 books or less at home in comparison to students who are not. They tend to have more books at home. However, it's not just the number of books at home. Okay, So just flooding a kid's house with books uh, is not the only solution. 
I find that students in the study on financial assistance were also less likely to have reading role models who read two or more different kinds of texts. Typically, they are more likely to report that parents don't read or parents only read one kind of text, and that would be the newspaper. Now, why is this important? Because if the parents are reading more kinds of text, it means there's more things around at home to see. Uh, my kids come home and they see me reading research articles, they see me reading the news, they see me reading books. So it becomes something that they see is as important. It's not just work. It is part of life. It is part of something you do every day. Second challenge is this. Most of the time, digital devices distract from long form and wide reading rather than support these practices. Now, I've got nothing against digital devices, so we're kind of really looking at the facts. And when we say long form reading, we're talking about reading books, right? Uh, reading things which require you to sustain your attention a little bit more. Uh, in our survey this year, what we found was that 95% of the students had access to a smartphone, um, their own smartphone. Uh, if you look at the other figure that in terms of e-reader, why e-reader? Because e-reader is specialized. It's just for reading, right? Only 81% 81, 81 of them said that they do not have an e-reader. So no specialized devices. And you need to remember it's an expensive device. So it's an expense on the family. Uh, again, situation has changed since then because although not all the students, a large number report having tablets and computers, whether they are owned or shared. But we know from July this year, all secondary school students, they will be having their own personal learning devices. Some schools will have tablets, some schools have Chromebooks, but the idea is that they are able to access uh, information or reading using technology. Then I think the question is, do they, will they? So, um, if you look at this table, what we found was that from the 2021 survey, so that's about over 5,000 students from seven different schools doing the survey. And what you will find if you look at the first line, number one, is that reading is correlated with reading enjoyment, reading frequency, and reading duration. So when you see the double asterisk, it means that it's significant. Uh, on the other hand, playing e-games, browsing social media apps, watching videos online and watching TV are negatively correlated with reading enjoyment, reading frequency and reading duration. So this suggests that device use may actually conflict with reading time. And in our interviews with students from one school, uh, what we found for some students, whether they liked reading or not, uh, you know, devices may have an impact on their reading. But sometimes the students told us, like, this first person, Joyce, right? I did have a phone, so I read in primary school because I wanted to kill time and stuff. And now you just use your phone to kill time. So she didn't really uh, use the phone for reading. On the other hand, David also says, I did hear about the app because we asked very specifically, we think that the NLB app is a great app to be using in terms of accessing online resources. So we asked him, you know, we asked the students, do you know what the NLB app do you, is? Do you use it? And David says, well, I don't have time for the app. These names are pseudonyms, so they're not the students' actual names. Um, what we also found was that adolescents who enjoy reading are more likely to use technology for reading. So if you look at this, students who read, who enjoy reading in blue, read more on print, read more on their smartphone, read more on the computer, e-readers, and using tablets. And here's a Dan, he's an avid reader, and he actually prefers to use the smartphone uh, and his technology rather than print because he says he can get his books from the NLB app and they're free. And I've highlighted the word search there in this quote, right? Where he says, I go to popular to get stationary. And when he's there, he's browsing in the adventure section, the teenage section, and he looks at the books that are interesting to him, but he goes and search it up on the NLB app and he reads it on the NLB app instead of buying. Uh, another student who says that she's an avid reader, she said, I would like go online and search for books. And sometimes I would also look at TikTok. Again, I've highlighted search because searching is very important. And the act of searching requires that you know what you want to look for. So, you know, if you're an avid reader, you know you want books, you have certain knowledge of books, you will search for it. But if you're not so knowledgeable about books, then that act of searching, which we may take for granted, becomes something that is a little bit more difficult. So 
do students make use of available public resources? So again, we were thinking about the NLB app. So we asked students the question, do you borrow eBooks or browse using the NLB mobile app, Overdrive or Libby? So as you can see, 5.9% of our students use it regularly. Some use it only during the holidays, especially for the upper secondary, because you know they're really busy in uh, during term time. Uh, then there's a bunch about 18% use it rarely or sometimes. Uh, what was uh, encouraging was that SEC ones in the data set used it more often than SEC fours. So, you know, the library has been doing a lot to promote. Schools have been promoting since primary school. And you can see the SEC ones are more familiar with the app. But when we looked at the interview data, we discovered that there were five categories of students. There were students who had not heard of the app at all. So they'll say like, what do you mean? What's the NLB app? What are you talking about? Uh, students who had heard of it, but not downloaded or tried it. Those who had tried it and did not use it after that for various reasons, because you know they had to use only their smartphone, it was not good on their eyes, or they just couldn't find the materials that they wanted. Students who used it regularly, and also students, the last one was surprising, who used the other app functions. So they may go to the physical library to borrow books, but they were not familiar with the ebook capacity uh, capability of the app. So the third challenge is this, uh, the idea that we need to understand the different affordances of different devices and how they influence reading in context. Now, a flute, the, the word of affordance, it basically means the design aspect of an object that suggests how it should be used. So if you look at the book cover of the design of Everyday Things by Don Norman, you'll see that the spout is on the same side of the handle. So when you kind of look at that, it doesn't make sense. And things are designed in order to help us make sense of it. And when we think about reading, um, there's the book, right? The book, uh, the affordance of the book, it's there to be flipped, it's there to be touched. It is a single device. You can't do anything with it except read it, okay? In contrast, we've got the phone. It is meant to be swiped. It is multifunctional. It's great for reading the news. It's great for buying things uh, on the different shopping platforms, but you can do many things on it. Okay, and why is affordance important and why do we need to think about it? Uh, when we asked students about what they preferred to use, uh, the interesting things was that more students this year preferred to use the smartphones, especially those who were 14 onwards, but they still like to use print. And when we interviewed them, most of them said they preferred to use print. Uh, why do they prefer to use print? It is more comfortable. They like the feel of turning the books. And when you have print, they can pass it on to each other and share it. Um, another factor is access to reading resources, right? So like Dan, he prefers reading online because it is more convenient. He can get many books. He can get it immediately. But on the other hand, uh, if you're not familiar with using online resources, it can become very confusing. Just like Jay, he says, you know, I couldn't find the right book that I wanted to read. And our teenagers, they are very savvy. They have purpose and choice. So Zach here, who is a boy who says he enjoys reading, says he'd rather read hard copy books. But when he's on the bus, he will read anime, manga, because you know he gets access to different resources. And even Fatin, who's not a reader, says, you know, I prefer to read a hard copy book because you don't get distracted. So understanding that devices distract helps us to think about what kinds of reading we want to encourage. So just to highlight, you know, when we think about uh, reading on these different devices, I know we talk about the Kindle quite often. It's something you can bring about, but people don't talk so much about the cost of a Kindle, right? That you've got to maintain it. You've got to have books inside, which you have to purchase. And what really stood out in the interviews, we interviewed 37 children, uh, 37 teenagers who were 14 and 15, and maybe two of them reported having a Kindle. And I thought this quote really stood out to me. Uh, the girl in Indica says, I don't really buy books on Kindle. Cause my parents just download books on it. I've only got Harry Potter on it. So here a child has a device, but the device is actually not allowing her to get more books, to find more books. So I think that's really an important consideration. You know, when are our, our teenagers able to find books using the devices, the technologies um, that they have? Um, so I think, you know, mainly what I just wanted to highlight with this point is that whatever the devices there are, we need to consider the cost 
as well as the affordance of e-reading. We need to ask, are students able to access books, say via the print? If we had 10 of the book on the ME in the library, 10 students would be able to read it and to return it. If we had the book on, say, an iPad that all the students had, and we allowed them to, we reminded them of it, they would read it. If it were on the phone, maybe um, would they be reading it as much or would they prefer to read it on the phone? So those are thoughts for consideration. So remember just now I, what I said about independent reading, that practice was the most important. So I think, you know, the question we asked the students was this, and I'm just going to highlight this and then kind of go on to my last slide, which is about implications. One of the questions we asked students what would make is what would make you read more? And I've highlighted three to point out, and you can see that 77.9% of the students said that they would read more if there was an interesting topic or if there was an interesting book that they found. Now, that's really important because what it's pointing out is that content is the most important. There needs to be a purpose to reading. And as parents, as teachers, it's about helping our students or our children find the right content, the right books, the right news, the right things that will help them click. The second thing that I highlighted in red is personal development, and that was only uh, sort of high across the express students in our data set. But I thought that was interesting because, you know, uh, that they wanted to read books about personal development. And I would include things like biographies, you know, books that, you know, if they were interested in a particular career, they might want to read up more uh, about it. Now, this is not to say that it's only reading. Of course, you can watch and some of the students may watch videos, they go onto TEDx, you know, or they go online to learn things. But we know that personal development is an important reason for our children and our teens when it comes to learning. Finally, I highlighted more time. It's kind of number six, but you know, it still had 30%. I think that's important because do we make time in school or at home for our children to read? And I do, think that, you know, we can make more effort to have sustained time in school for children to read. So finally, here on my last slide, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about is how do we create an ecology for reading? And these are four words, um, four S words uh, that, you know, I've been sort of mulling over. I think the idea that, you know, we need to help students search um, or students want to search, you know, how, how can they help how can we help them find things, right? It's also something that they socialize around. If you have friends who read or teachers who read, you might be more inclined to read. We might also need to scaffold students reading. Uh, if they don't know where to find books, how to find books, we need to teach them or we need to provide examples for them. And it needs to be sustained over a long period of time. Don't give up the first time you do it and it doesn't work. You need to do it over a period of time. So just four questions here, which I'll just read out. Can we find interesting materials for teens to read? Have we read some of what they would like to read so we can recommend it to them? Notice I highlight they, okay? Not have we some interesting reads that we would like them to read, but what do they like to read? Number two, can we provide sustained time in class for students to read? Uh, what we found in our studies is that even students who like to read, uh, they do appreciate time in class. And for students who may not like to read as much, the time in class or school allows them to then have some time to read. Um, I may talk a little bit more about how this time should be created. It doesn't always need to be silent reading. It really depends on the profile of our students, but that's for another talk. Okay, number three, can we make use of class time to introduce students to the NLB app and give them time to play with the app to find the right books? You know, when kids are into kind of games, they play with the apps, they learn it. That's how they learn, right? In the same way, we need to play with apps, reading apps to learn how to use it. But it may be less motivating for some kids compared to a game. So can we give them time in class to do it? And finally, can we introduce teens to different reading resources? You know, other than books, what about news apps? What about online magazines? Uh, what about, say, online comics, you know, to expand their reading options? So thank you very much, everyone. I look forward to your questions later. I did see some raised hands, but we're going to get through with the talks first. So back to you, Joy.
Thank you, Jenny. I'm sure you have lots of questions uh, for her. Please key them into the Q&A chat and we will have some time for her to answer them later. In the meantime, let us welcome our second speaker for today. Uh, she's Sarah Monzi, the Director of Libraries at Dulwich College. Sarah wears many hats as teacher, librarian and also author. She wrote the Paw Print series of books which are published in Singapore. She'll be offering some insights from the Dulwich College uh, research project conducted together with Tini, and she'll be sharing reading habits of children aged uh, 7 to 11, as well as their favourite titles and genre. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Chin E. As I do, I'm going to explain to you what my role is. So I'm the Director of Libraries at Dulwich College, Singapore. To give you some of you um, context on that, I'm a teacher librarian, and I know in many countries and many schools around the world, they don't have teacher librarians. A teacher librarian is someone with a teaching qualification and a library qualification, um, and they work in school libraries to support teachers and students promoting, um, promoting literature. So you can connect with me in a variety of ways that you can see on the screen. But moving on to the next slide, please. So in summary, a teacher librarian really works with students about reading for information and reading for pleasure. Now, reading for pleasure is one of my favorite topics that I could talk about endlessly. And reading for information is a crucial part of learning and educating in this day and age. So we really need to make our students savvy in searching for information, for finding information that they require to determine fake news and real information. So that's a big part of what we teach in our schools. And the reading for pleasure is all about finding books that we read. And when we do those things together, learning and even deep learning does take place. So moving on, please. Now, this is just some data I wanted to share with you um, about how we do our annual reports at Dulwich College Singapore. We look at a, lot, at a lot of data and a lot of that data drives our decision making in our libraries. So we're lucky enough to have three libraries in the college. Um, it's a school that has students from age two right through to the age of 18 and our libraries cater for those different ages of students. So on the left, you can see a lot of digital resources and we really do promote the reading and use of digital resources, both for information and reading for pleasure. Um, things like Encyclopedia Britannica for when children are researching. And then the statistics on the right really shows you how well used our libraries really, really are. So moving on, I'm gonna delve down a little bit. Chinny has really spoken about adolescents and teenagers, and I'm going to speak more about the seven to 11 years category. And the library I work in at Dulwich College Singapore is the junior school library. It has students from age seven to age 11. And that is really that age where our students have just gained proficiency in reading. They are, a lot of them are absolutely loving becoming independent readers as well as reading with adults. And it's that age where we need to keep them as readers so that we go, they go on to continue to be great readers as adolescents and teenagers. So this is just some data we look at. On the left there, you can see the percentage of our collection. So for example, our collection has 31% nonfiction books at the moment. If I look at that in 2017, it was actually 40% of the collection. And we've made some big decisions on not growing that part quite as much because we really do like to direct students to current information sources digitally as well as non-fiction books. So we absolutely do love non-fiction books and we do buy lots of new titles and promote the non-fiction. But you can see on the right that only 30% of the borrowings was non-fiction. So um, those statistics correlate quite well. Another one just to point out on this slide I think is worth noting is the graphic novels make up 6.5% of our collection, yet 17% of our borrowing. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in another slide, but let's move on. So Chin E and I, along with Suja, one of her PhD students, have recently undertaken some research in my library and we did a mixed methods case study research. So we surveyed over 700 of our 880 students 
we did focus group interviews with students from each year group and we analyzed a lot of library borrowing data and i want to share some of those findings with you today so those of you who are educators it might help guide you in some decision making on what sort of books would be great to share with your students those who are in libraries for collection development and those who are parents to know what really might be that book that hooks your child into reading. And we really did also look at how their reading preferences change as they grow older. Um, and this was, there were some really in interesting observations. So um, moving on to the next slide, you're going to see a lot of titles of books. And this was a question in the survey where the children were asked, what was your favorite book you read this year? Um, now, there were over 200 students in each year group who answered this survey question, so it was their absolute favourite. So to get in the top 20, the book had to have been read by a number of students. Now, a few interesting observations here, things like Harry Potter, hugely popular in all of the year groups. Um, but what I want to bring your attention to is the top book in year five, Alex Ryder by Anthony Horowitz, the top book in year six, which is Rooftoppers by Catherine Rundell, and Wonder was the second favourite by RJ Palacio. Now, what's really interesting about this is these three books are actually taught by the teachers in the curriculum in our school. So what happens is the teachers um, read these texts with the whole class, they actually have their own individual copies, and they really delve deeply into these books. And isn't that amazing to see that so many students said that was the best book they read this year. So that really tells us this works. This is something we should be doing as educators and we should be choosing current books that our children are going to enjoy to delve deeply into that. Let's move on to the next slide. And I've gathered some data from these top 20 books in each year group. I've only included a few genres um, here on the left because these happen to be the ones that came up in the survey. At the bottom of the screen, you can see a few of the genres, fantasy, humor, etc. Now in our library, we actually have these genre stickers stuck onto the spine of our books, which is just another tool for children to be able to discover if they know they love adventure books, they'll go looking for that genre sticker. Now, what I want you to really have a look at here is how humor decreases as the students get older and realistic fiction. So those books often that have a child having a problem, a book like Wonder is a really great example, looking at diversity um, is really good in these titles. So it really tells us that our children are wanting more serious reads as they get older. So I don't know about you, perhaps year three, year four, those seven, eight, nine year olds are having a little bit more fun in life. So that's an interesting um, look at the genres. If we go to the next slide, um, if we move on, let's look at the formats. Now, just to define some of these formats for you. So junior fiction is those long chapter books like the Alex Rider, like Wonder, like Harry Potter. Graphic novels are uh, longer comic style books. Um, hugely popular, I'll be talking about that. Our early fiction are the short um, chapter books, great sort of first reads for our students who are just becoming proficient readers and feel really proud of themselves when they can get through a chapter book uh, quickly. And nonfiction, I think, needs no explanation. So if we look there at the increase in junior fiction, it really shows that for the children picking their favorite book, as they're reading proficiency and development, as they get older, most of them are picking their favorite is junior fiction. Now that's not to say the graphic novels aren't hugely popular with our older students, because in fact they really are. But the favorite books obviously are those ones that children can access mostly independently and enjoy. So let's move on to the next slide. And this actually is some different data. This is actually looking at the top 10 books that were borrowed from our library this year. Now, I do want to highlight from all of these last lists that I've shown you that depending on what school you were doing this in, depending what country you were doing this in, you would find different books that the children chose. But there's definitely titles that no matter the country, um, no matter the socioeconomic status of the children, no matter what lens we're looking through, they would sort of transcend time. Now, you will notice that I've highlighted a number of these books in red, and I really wanted to talk about this for a key reason. At Dulwich College and many of the international schools in Singapore, we follow something called the Red Dot Book Awards. And these books are chosen by um, teacher librarians across um, 
the international schools in Singapore. And at Dulwich College, we use these books and we really promote them and we do a Reader's Cup event. Every student in junior school is encouraged to read at least one. There's eight in different age categories for these. And you might want to look at the red dot books um, online because there's some great titles. And we do buy multiple copies. So, of course, it is easier to get 244 circulations of Mr Wolf's class because we had 10 copies of this book. Um, now, from this da data, I want to show you some key light highlights of what we found when we looked at the top 50. So if we move on to the next slide, it's going to show you from the top 50 books, these are some really interesting key findings, which I think for any of you who work in schools are key for promoting books. Students love series books. So 84% in the top 50 books were books from a series. Recent releases are really popular. So it's so easy as adults to recommend books that we have really positive experiences with as a child, but sometimes our children won't necessarily um, lead to them. Yes, if you love Dean and Blighton, share them with your child, but if they don't get hooked into that, try something else. So there's so much, publishers are publishing so much great contemporary literature. So recent releases are very popular. Students enjoy humour, as I said earlier, maybe our younger students more so because 46% were funny books. And really important that promoting books, book awards raises awareness for new and different titles. Um, author talks build the reading culture from our top 50 books. We were lucky enough to have four of those authors do Zoom um, online talks with our students this year. And finally, book promotion works. As Tinny spoke about earlier, take the time to have sustained reading, but take the time to be promoting different books to our children because different books will appeal to the other students. Now, one other key finding, if we move on to the next slide, will be a really important one for you all. And that is that comics are king. 68% of the top 50 borrowed books in our library were comics. Now I showed you earlier, Mr. Wolf's class, which is a really fun one that was popular with our younger students. But some of our comics can be really deep and complicated and mature. This is a, an amazing example called White Bird, which is a companion book to RJ Palacio's Wonder. And it's um, a coffee, uh, delves into some really, really uh, serious themes and mature themes. So all our students are reading gr graphic novels. There can be a real stigma. Some parents um, tell their children they need to stop reading graphic novels, they need to stop reading comics. But from our focus group interviews, we really did find that a lot of our very proficient readers were preferring comics more than some of our students who had challenges with reading. And on the graph on the screen, you can see that we can barely keep up with how many books are borrowed and how we're growing that part of our collection in the library. So we're listening to what the students are seeing what they want and we continue to grow. And we've got a lot of new books arriving in August. So moving on to the next slide, I want to share with you, um, just to follow up on what Chin E spoke about earlier, print or digital. In our survey, we also found that students have a strong preference for reading print over digital. So we're definitely not saying don't use digital. Digi digital reading can be great. Um, Kindle reading can be great because it's using that one device and not having the distractions where you can swipe and open up into other things. Audio books are brilliant. Um, there are many ways that we can use print and digital. And a lot of students like both, even though they have a preference for print if they can. So moving on, please. Now, a couple of digital resources that are really useful. We've talked about the NLB app. It's incredible for those of you who are here in Singapore. Um, Libby or Overdrive has thousands of books. Tumble Book Library is wonderful for our younger children. And Press Reader is great for probably age seven all the way through to us adults because it has thousands of newspapers and magazines and they're all free when you are a member of the National Library. Now on the bottom right, I've got the icon Borrow Box. That's the ebook and audiobook library our school uses. Um, and there are many others available that different schools may buy subscriptions to. And EPIC, it has an exclamation mark because it is EPIC. If you are an educator of primary school children and you don't know about EPIC, look it up. You can join for free and share thousands of books with your students within school hours. If you're a parent, you can join um, for a minimal fee and thousands of books accessible for your children. So let's move on. 
So I would give you a few quick tips for building a library collection uh, for those of you who are educators working in schools and those of you working in libraries. So please do listen to what the children are reading, conduct a survey to find out their reading preferences and use the borrowing data to drive book collection growth as well. Now, if you have a small budget, which I know is the reality in so many schools, and I know there's some schools um, around the world without libraries at all, of course, um, but there are options in Singapore and other countries to run book fairs where you can earn book credits. Um, Scholastic do great online ones. Here in Singapore, we have a, a great bookseller called Closet Full of Books. They will do book fairs at your school and you can earn credits um, for books that then you can put on the shelves in your libraries. Closet Full of Books, uh, Denise as well gives incredible suggestions for reading. So if you're an educator building a book collection, do speak to her. Um, using national libraries, the NLB as schools, we can join and borrow thousands of books that we can then, uh, sorry, hundreds of books at a time that we can make su supplementary loans. And really importantly, um, ensure there are books for all reading abilities. Um, read reviews, talk to librarians and booksellers. And if you're looking for some specific recommendations, I've got a link there um, to my blog where I've got some reading lists for all these ages that you can click on because I know many of us educators are time poor and don't have time to do all of these things. So moving on. So when we're building that collection, really do think about accessibility. We need to have books for all kinds of readers. Um, the five finger rule is a tip we use with all of our students to think about whether a book is the right reading ability for them. They read a page. Um, if, if they're getting more than three, four, five words incorrect on that page or they didn't know what they meant, that book could be too challenging for them to access themselves. So very useful tip there. Audiobooks, brilliant for our reluctant readers, brilliant for all kinds of readers, in fact. And there's a lot of research that does show the benefits of listening to audiobooks as well. High low books, really important. So high low means high interest but low challenge. So for those children who are a little bit older and find reading a challenge, but we want them to be reading something that is mature for their age category. A lot of publishers um, produce high low books. And dyslexia friendly formats are very important. And a lot of our digital resources do have an option to click um, and change the font into a dyslexia friendly font, which is very beneficial. Um, moving on now, some of you are probably thinking, I don't know where to begin. I've told you I've got a list that I shared earlier on my blog um, with book recommendations, but these are four places I go as a teacher librarian to get suggestions to build my book collections. And this is just a tip of a very large iceberg. As parents, what should I read next? Get your children to have an explorer on there. It's brilliant. They can put on a book that they've really enjoyed and they've just finished and they want to get more that are similar and that will give them a lot of suggestions. So great one to explore. And moving on, this is a little tip that you could do in your library um, or in your school or in your classroom, but we had students help us make these posters. So I really enjoyed the bad guys books. They were so funny, but I don't know what to read next. Well, here's 16 titles for you. And these posters are also shared on my blog and I'm happy to share um, editing rights to anyone who wanted to make them for their own schools. Moving on to the last few slides now. So I know we have time for questions because there's plenty coming in. Um, a few tips for reading for pleasure. Create book and reading events. Get excited about reading. Um, follow book awards or create your own book award in a school. Like I said earlier, embed children's books into the collection. And it doesn't have to be just long chapter book reads. Picture books can be embedded all the time and can be a brilliant provocation. Um, author talks can be expensive and quite rightly, these authors do deserve to be paid for their time. Um, but if you don't have a budget for this, there's lots of authors who have read alouds, short talks, little promotions online that you can share with your students as a little taste and an introduction to authors. Um, you can run book clubs, students can run book clubs and you can use book talks or recommendations to encourage students to discover new books. Now, when you do do a book talk, you have to give the students FOMO, fear of missing out. You have to talk about that book like it's the most exciting thing that you've ever read. And I promise you they will start wanting to borrow that book and then train up the children so they can do the same. They can do a short, sharp book talk and recommend to each other. And like Jim E said, we all need to be reading advocates. Moving on to the last few tips. 
And for those of you working in libraries or in schools where you want to support the library staff, these are some tips that really help. Um, clear signage helps. Front-facing books, I could say, a hundred times in a row. You can see the bottom photo. There are so many covers facing out. This sells the books. That helps the children discover them. A shelf with just all books in a spine doesn't lead to as much discoverability. Um, if you can, have digital book displays with different books or book reviews coming across the screen. Have comfortable furniture. Make it a library where everyone can talk and collaborate. You don't have to be shushing them. They should be sharing. They should be happy. They should want to go to that library. I talked about genre labels earlier that we stick onto the spine of our books as a little tip. Um, and access to the library book catalogue where they can browse as well is really key. I'm going to finish with two really special quotes. Um, as adults, we all have this job to help the children we work with or live with find the right book. I truly believe there are uh, the right books for everyone. So wise words by JK Rowling. And I will finish with the last slide moving on from Neil Gaiman, who is a fabulous author. He says, we have an obligation to read aloud to our children, to read them things they enjoy, to read to them stories we are already tired of, to do the voices, to make it interesting, and not to stop reading to them just because they learn to read themselves. And going on from that, as the students are older, we have that responsibility to talk to them about what they are reading, get excited about what they are reading, and keep showing them that you are a reader.